Hello, fellow AP Lang teachers, Jim Jordan, Sacred Heart Cathedral Prep in San Francisco. And today I want to talk with you briefly about helping our students write effective conclusions uh, for their essays, something that many of them um, ask us frequently how to do. One of the points I want to make is that this is, this advice I'm about to offer, I think a key to earning the coveted sophistication point, as it certainly is a key to sophisticated writing. So, of course, we know that all essays have essentially three components, an introduction, some development or a line of reasoning, and then a conclusion. Um, that's not always the case, but this is certainly the format that our students are most comfortable with. It's, it's what, um, what essays, what AP essays look like as well. If you break it down a little further, you can see that whether it's the intro, the body, or the conclusion, any of these paragraphs, you are really dealing with nothing more than a series of claims and evidence. And organizing them in the most effective order is a key to success. In fact, uh, if you look at an op-ed column, they often break the paragraphs sentence by sentence. So paragraph breaks are a rhetorical choice. And the key thing is understanding how to organize claims and evidence effectively um, if, if you want to earn high scores on these essays. So conclusions can be problematic because many of our students will simply tack on um, a contrived or redundant conclusion, repackaging their intro. And we see phrases like this as signals a lot. We see them in our classrooms and we see them at the AP reading too. Uh, we've all seen models like this before. I'm not here to beat up on the five paragraph essay today. That's that's somebody else's video. Uh, one of the things you'll notice here, though, is that the thesis statement, and this is the common five paragraph, this is the problem version, right, where it, where it presents itself sort of as a list. And the thesis statement happens twice here and then again here. And then we have this inverted triangle. A lot of textbooks in years past uh, would offer this uh, in writing courses. I don't see it as much anymore, but our, su our students know it. So I try not to knock this model, but I do want to use it as a springboard to help them um, become more sophisticated writers after they've learned this. Now, if we go back to the classical oration model, this is Aristotle, I think we start to find one of the reasons that we see repetitive conclusions. Yes, I'm actually uh, blaming this a little bit on Aristotle. Well, not really on Aristotle. Uh, the six parts of the classical oration are probably familiar to all of you. They essentially are the same. Uh, you know, if you take this, you've got your intro here, and then you'd have this would all be your line of reasoning, these four here, and then your conclusion. All well and good, all effective, even still today. Here's the thing, though. When you look more closely at, at what Aristotle said, he felt that the most effective way to conclude was by summarizing or even reiterating a key point. Okay, that to me is a red flag. But I do think a lot of students and teachers use it because Aristotle said so, right? Here's the problem. Aristotle, the king of rhetoric, lived a full and successful life 1,700 years before Gutenberg came along. And of course, the implication there uh, for us is that Aristotle's advice on arguments could not possibly have applied to written texts. Repeating yourself, summarizing in a speech is an effective rhetorical choice at times because it's powerful. Um, the audience can't rewind. They can't go back and reread. Reiterating a key point works. In a written text, especially a short argument, um, you are running the risk of offending your audience. You're insulting their intelligence by asking them to read the same thing twice. So it is often lethal to repeat yourself or summarize in a written argument. So what's the solution when your students ask, what do I do? I think it is stasis theory, which we can attribute to another, one of Aristotle's, uh, I don't know if they were quite contemporaries, but Hermagoras was another um, ancient Greek writer, and uh, I couldn't find a marble statue image of him, sorry. So I'll just give credit though where it's due. Hermagoras came up with this originally, and it essentially argues that every argument uh, addresses a a key question at issue, but it is in most textbooks applied only to larger arguments. And so I think a lot of teachers and students struggle to find a practical application for it. Uh, I think we can use it at the claim level to really help us, particularly with conclusions. Every claim is in fact one of either fact definition, quality, or policy, not just an entire argument, but at the claim level. Climate change is real, it's happening. That is a claim of fact. 
Uh, climate change manifests itself as extremes in weather conditions. We have sometimes it's freezing, sometimes it's 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 very hot, right? So that's that's a claim of definition. Claim of quality would be an evaluation. This is the biggest problem of our time, and a claim of policy would be, you know, that we need to reduce our carbon footprint. Something along those lines. A call to action. Once you understand that every claim falls into one of those categories, you can start to manipulate your claims to 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 fit one of the four. So the solution simply to writing effective conclusions is instead of repackaging your thesis, simply pivot to a new stasis category. If you've written an evaluative argument to this point, pivot to a policy claim to finish. You see this often in op-eds. Um, the, a, a writer will evaluate an issue and then conclude by with a call to action about going to the ballot box or whatever it is. And in fact, in the synthesis essay on the AP Lang exam for years, we saw an invitation to do exactly this. Um, Daylight savings, the penny coin, the United States Postal Service, monuments. There were several synthesis topics uh, in which students were asked to evaluate the pros and cons, which would be your central claim and your line of reasoning, and then offer a recommendation about its continued use, which is pivoting to um, a call to action or a policy claim. So I hope you found that helpful. Um, this has been very successful with my students. I do think it is a key to earning the sophistication point. And once your students can internalize it, I think they're going to be off and running. Hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very much uh, for being with me today.